Now, these last two days that I will discuss this topic, um, I've been trying to select which place. So sometimes I do speed reading, because I've read this book many, many times. I just do speed reading to pinpoint, to zero in, okay, which one, which one, which chapter, which chapter. And it's so hard for me to decide because in every chapter there's some kind of very profound teaching that jumps out from the pages. It never ceases to amaze me. Uh, but also there's a variety of topics in each chapter. Uh, because these were informal talks, this was not a written book. Srila Bhakti Rakshak Sridhar Maharaj sat on the veranda in Koladweep, Srinavadweep Dham, in the early 1980s and mid-1980s. And there he sat while fortunate souls from around the world were able to come there and sit in front of him and to drink the nectar of his unlimited katha that was just springing forth from this fountain of his entire life of experiences uh, and his life of devotion and extreme bhajan in Srinavadvip Dham uh, and the service that he had done to his spiritual master Shri Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. So it was, really, it was really astonishing how, um, it was amazing to me how I had that good fortune because this personality, who was the grand general of the, Vaish, of the Gaudiya Vaishnavas at the time, so senior and superior and revered and regarded and worshipped by even personalities like my own guru, Srila Kesi Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. Uh, he was his Siksha guru. Uh, and also by Srila Bhaktivedanta Narayan Goswami Maharaj, considered him a Siksha Guru. By Srila Bhakti Pragyan Keshav Goswami Maharaj, who took sannyas from him. Sri Bhakti Pramod Puri Maharaj also considered him his Siksha Guru. So many. But yet, a totally insignificant, foolish jiva who has, had spent a few years in Krishna consciousness, and I'm able to sit in front of the same personality who barely anybody is sitting there. In one occasion, only two people, myself and this other devotee. Uh, and this was his life in very seclusion. He would sit on this veranda and deeply relish, that's what he explained. My life is to relish the conclusions of the previous acharyas and to taste their, uh, all of their inner moods that they express in their writings, their shlokas, and from Bhagavatam, Chaitam Charitamrita, the books of the Goswamis, he would sit there and relish. And even though uh, our Srila Prabhupada very specifically told his leaders of his movement that when they questioned him, who can we go to for guidance after you depart from this world? He directly said, My Godmother, Srila B. R. Bhakti Raksha, Sri Dharma Maharaj. So that was very clear. Uh, and many other statements also. I often tell the story of how I came to the conclusion that I have to go to him. You see, I'm not going to get into a whole topic, but I just want to touch on this. Because of the illusions and the anarthas in conditioned souls, even though the leaders of the movement went to him initially and consulted with him, which topics are actually some of them of these speeches are in his book where he's answering their questions. And he was clarifying everything, making everything very clear. And he was demonstrating that what Prabhupada had told was true, that he's the one to go to for guidance. But yet, at some point, because of the illusion, his uh, leaders had developed very great misconceptions uh, and therefore they no longer uh, continued to go to him. And this 
scenario, we saw it repeated more than once in our lives. So, the topics of Sri Guru Tattva that Srila Sridharma spoke, both before, while he was being accepted by them, and as well as after, they're in this book. And they're very relevant topics. Very relevant. How can we guide our spiritual life so that we don't become deviated from the goal? And there's one particular chapter in here, uh, out of 14 different chapters, <coughs> in which Srila Sridhar Maharaj explains the difference between uh, the consciousness of being in a society, like a Vaishnava institution, uh, society consciousness, he calls it. And the difference between that and God consciousness. Even though the society is uh, established by the topmost God conscious person for the purpose of God consciousness, that everybody will develop God consciousness, that whole society is founded for that purpose and especially for the purpose of associating with those persons who have God-consciousness, namely Krishna consciousness. Therefore, the societies are named International Society for Krishna Consciousness, Gaudiya Vedanta, Samiti, and many, many other names, uh, Gaudiya Mat. And they all have the same purpose, the same aim, so that conditioned souls can come into the most favorable environment by which they can receive the seed of bhakti within their heart from those who have it and from those who are following those who have it. It's all very favorable association. And within this environment, one will be amply supplied with Guru, the principle of Guru, on many different levels, not just on the highest level. There are different levels of Guru, because there's different levels of Vaishnavas, and there's different levels of realization of those Vaishnavas. And those who are higher than myself in their realization can help me. Yes. We experience that, you know in our first days of being devotees in 1970, when the Krishna consciousness movement in the Western countries had maybe only 300 actual initiated disciples and they were spread out here and there. Um, and we came into a temple which was very, very dynamic kind of with hearing and chanting about Krishna and so much potency was there. And the devotees in the temple the senior ones were maybe six months they've been devotees, or one year. Uh, there was no one that was more than that. But some of them, a couple of them, a few of them, had actually received initiation already from the pure devotee, Srila Prabhupada, and they were following his teachings. <coughs> and they had also personally met him. So to us, that was extremely helpful when they told us their experience of being with Prabhupada, their experience of hearing from him, their understanding of the teachings. And even though their understanding was not really so highly developed, but they had faith. They had this you know, shraddha, faith in Prabhupada, faith in this process, faith like this. So in that environment, we all flourished even the new ones. We all flourished because we were all doing bhakti together. We were all serving the Guru together, trying to execute his order. We learned by direct experience what does it mean to surrender to Guru, to surrender to his instructions. Without surrendering to his instructions, we have not, no real connection with Guru. So even though we had not met our Guru physically, but his instructions were there in his books and in his disciples. So this principle of Guru Tattva also descends into this world through the arrangement of Krishna 
that a jiva comes into a circle of Vaishnavas, even of very beginning levels Vaishnavas. But whoever is higher than myself can help me. And that is the principle upon which this movement went all over the world. Sometimes we hear devotees in this more recent period uh, and in the Sangha of our Gurudev because the subject matters that have been discussed have been on the highest levels. Uh, what is Radha Dasyam? Service to the lotus feet of Shimati Radhika. Uh, I remember one person, devotee, Mukundaprabhu, I think, from England, when he came into the association of Gurudev, he had not come from any other society of devotees, Iskan or anything. He came directly to Gurudev's association and Gurudev Sangha. And this was at the point when Gurudev had been touring in the West for maybe one or two years. So then uh, years later, after he had been associated in our Sangha and living in India quite a lot, and hearing very, very high topics. I remember speaking with him one day, and he was telling me, you know, I'm realizing that I have to go back to the basics. Uh, because when I entered into this movement, I entered into Radha Kunda. <laughs> I entered into those topics. And for years I've heard those topics, but I realized that uh, my foundation is not strong. So therefore, now I'm going back and I'm reading Bhagavad Gita. And I'm studying, and I'm studying the cantos of Srimad Bhagavatam, like this. So the, the movement of Gurudev's actually was focusing on the highest and ultimate goal and attainment for all Gaudiya Vaishnavas, followers of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. But how many were qualified to actually even understand it, let alone have attraction and realize it? But yet, he gave this. And he was giving it specifically not for the masses, although he was speaking in open assemblies and different types of assemblies, uh, and he would speak appropriately for that assembly. But in any case, he was always there to bring everyone to the highest conception of what is actually uh, Raj Bhakti, pure Bhakti, and ultimately the moods of the eternal associates of Krishna and Vrindavan, and especially amongst them, what are the moods of his most intimate eternal associates, the Brita Gopis? What is Gopi praying? Ultimate pinnacle of Srimad Bhagavatam. But in order to understand that, it is not that someone can suddenly come and hear this, and then suddenly begin to even aspire for this, you see. One time Srila Prabhupada, there's a quote that we always remember from the early period, where Prabhupada kind of summarized what should be our approach to all the higher topics, uh, even the 10th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, Krishna's pastime. He said, First deserve, and then desire. Remember that one? First deserve, and then desire. Not first desire, and then deserve. Now how do we reconcile this? Even in millions of birds of doing 
times. I'll help you with this stuff. Yeah. <coughs> Shri Gurudev's mission was very specific. It, his mission was to complete the mission that Srila Prabhupada had started. <coughs> to complete the education that the devotees who came into the movement of Prabhupada, that, <coughs> that they would now be able to grasp the entire full picture and spectrum of what it is that this movement uh, exists for, what did Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu descend into this world to give, and his, along with his associates? What is the process through which he gave it? Very, very high subject matters. Even hearing those subjects will purify the heart very powerfully, even if someone doesn't understand it. You see? Yes? Just to be in the presence of a realized Maha Bhagavat, Uttam. Rasik Vaishnava. To hear that sound vibration from him, even if somebody just wandered into some and he doesn't know anything, how much potency that jiva will be endowed with in his heart through the power of the pure devotee. That was also the same principle of any of our great acharyas. But when it comes to the specific mission that the acharya is, is in the world to accomplish, they also define this mission. They also clarify. And many times, uh, Srila Gurudev, he explained, I am giving these higher subject matters uh, for very few, actually. In the whole assembly, there may be two, three, four who can really enter and understand and fully appreciate. But all others, they will get a sprinkle. And it will lay, it will place a seed in their heart that in the future, when they receive more sanusanga, they hear more, then gradually, gradually they'll become qualified. Because this is actually the process that's been taking place for all of us over many lifetimes. Although we don't know, we cannot remember, but Krishna knows. And Krishna in our heart is watching everything. And he has seen, uh, had, as we've accumulated, Wandering in the universe, we've accumulated Sukriti for many lifetimes. What type of Sukriti? Bhakti Unmukha Sukriti. Even Agyata, not knowing that we're getting this Sukriti. Krishna is so merciful. His devotees are so merciful. His dham is so merciful. Everything is filled with mercy. So that principle of mercy lets the jivas who are suffering. Look at all the jivas here in this universe. Uh, inconceivable, infinite number of jivas. Uh, and beyond this infinite number of jivas. So, but yet Krishna has a plan for each and every tiny, tiny little atomic particle sized jiva. Every single jiva will come to him. Because why? Jiva surupoi Krishna nitidas. That is the eternal swarup of every single living being. Whether they're in the body of an ant, or a microbe, huh? or they're in the body of an elephant, or they're in the body of a demigod. Whatever situation that jiva, that conscious living being, is in, they actually only have one eternal swarup. That means their very own identity, their eternal form and their eternal function, their swarup. Only one. Not two. And what is that? Mahaprabhu taught. Jiva Swarup Hoi Krishna Nityatas. The only Swarup of the Jiva is the what? Eternal Nitya servant Das of Krishna. He didn't say Vishnu, he didn't say Narayan, he didn't say any other. He said Krishna Das. Why? Because Krishna is ultimately the source of everything and every expansion, and every incarnation, He is the source. Uh, Lord Brahma declared this fact in the first verse of his Brahma Samhita, and there he told, <coughs> Ishwara Parama Krishna. 
the supreme controller of all controllers is Krishna. He knows. He knows because he's the highest authority in the universe. He's the first guru in the universe. He's the first disciple in the universe. And who's his guru? Krishna himself. Huh? So all other Vedic knowledge comes down from him. So he knows. Huh? This is why Vedic knowledge is the ultimate. And we can say that. We're not ashamed or fearful to say that to anybody. Anybody. Vedic knowledge is the ultimate. Huh? It is a fact. And it, you can realize that fact. And when you realize that fact, then you'll understand everything else is relative to that. And everything else is below that. Some person may say, oh, you people, you have so much ego, and you're saying that you have, you're, you have the only way, or you have the highest way, or this and that. And you say, yes, we do. And we invite you, come. We'll show you. We'll prove it to you. Huh? will prove to you that whatever way that you have, and whatever process and whatever beliefs that you have are way down on the scale of transcendental knowledge. It may be that you're in connection with some degree of God consciousness. We don't deny that. We're not condemning any other uh, sincere approach to the Supreme Lord. We're not condemning that at all. But we're admitting the fact. Uh, just like in a university, you admit the fact. This is on this level, this scientific level, there's another level, there's another level, and nobody tries to challenge that because it's self-evident. If you're a mathematics student on the beginning level and you go into the physics class, you'll understand nothing. But those who've gone through all the progressive levels, then they can immediately understand when they enter into the physics because their background of knowledge is fully developed. So in the same way, knowledge of God consciousness has been unfolded by Krishna in the universe gradually, gradually, gradually. So that the jivas in every level will be able to gradually make some progress towards Him. So every jiva is eternal servant of Krishna in their ultimate true identity. True identity. Swarup, their eternal form. And what is the attainment of perfection? What is the actual definition of mukti? Mukti means liberation. It's a very beloved word, even of my vadis, impersonalists, yogis. Mukti, mukti, mukti. And here in, in uh, <coughs> Jagannath Puri, Sri Sarvabhava Bhattacharya, he was an impersonalist actually posing, but nevertheless, he was an impersonalist, my body, and he loved the word mukti. Just like in the Vedanta Sutra, we've been hearing in the classes that there are other, you know, philosophers, and there's Shankaracharya who gave this interpretation and that and that, but their, their aim is mukti, you see. So, because mukti means liberation, no longer have to suffer in the material existence of birth and death, disease, old age all the sufferings and having to repeat this again and again. Mukti means you get out. You escape from the prison house. It's a good thing, very nice thing, to get out of the prison house and live your normal life. But yet, their understanding of Mukti is very, very limited. Why? Because they don't admit uh, what is their own eternal identity and what is the supreme identity of the ultimate uh, Muktipada uh, Muktipada and Mukunda, Krishna, giver of liberation Mukunda, he who gives Mukti uh, so what is the ultimate destination? they don't know this the impersonalists, they don't know this and they deny this even some of them they even deny the personal form of the Lord and his own identity. They want to kill the Supreme. It's very demoniac. That's why Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, even if the Mayavadis chant the name of Krishna, it's like thunderbolts on the body of Krishna. Not pleasant. Huh? Not pleasant. Why? Because their mood has no loving mood of service and surrender to Krishna. They want to become him. They want to kick away the ladder that they used to climb up 
by worshiping the deity form and kick it away. Now I become the deity. This is the ultimate ego. And as it is called by Prabhupada, it is the last snare of the illusory energy. The last snare. You know, a snare means like a trap, like a like a like an animal in the forest. The the hunter places a trap there, and suddenly the animal, unaware, steps into the trap and it closes, and he's, he's captured. So Maya Devi has set many different snares and traps uh, for those who are not sincere. For those who are not actually sincerely trying to approach the Supreme Absolute Truth. That sincerity begins with what? Sri Prabhupada told it very simply one day. Okay? He said, knowledge means to know. God is great. And I am small. Therefore, I should surrender to Him. That's called knowledge. You don't have to be a PhD. You don't have to be an educated person. You don't have to be it. You can be a farmer plowing the fields. But if you know this, you're far more advanced than the big, big scholars and my bodies and impersonalists and persons who, although they've been educated and they've been, uh, they pride themselves in having such vast knowledge, but in actuality, they're captured by the final snare of Maya, which is what? I will become God! Yes! Well, kind of like that, but God is even greater. <laughs> They believe that they're going to become that supreme entity. And how can they believe such a thing? How is it possible for someone to believe such a thing? Because this is a very abnormal kind of thinking to a normal thinking person. <laughs> what? I'm God? What? You know, some person that comes initially into the association of Mayavad, which there's a lot of it nowadays, and you'll hear, oh, I am the divine. I, you are the divine. Oh, we are the we are we are the supreme. We are the one. We are, and it's all very flowery. Sounds nice, but in actuality, <clears throat> to a normal thinking person, it's bizarre. What? Me? God? Yes, you're God, but you just don't realize it yet. <laughs> and there's a way by which you can. Realize that you're God. So just come to me and pay me $5,000 and I'm going to give you a mantra by which you're going to realize that you're God. And then after that, if you want some mystic powers, then come to me and pay me $1 million. And I'm not joking. There was such a course in a particular society. <laughs> we have a person here that can vouch for that. So there was a course that they were charging $1 million for learning how to fly. Wasn't it? Yeah? Yeah? Mystic yoga flying. $1 million? That sounds pretty good to a person that has 30, 50, 100 million. Yeah, I can, one million, I can learn how to, okay. So there was actually maybe, I don't know, I heard there was like 30, 40 people that actually gave a million and signed up for the course. But if you check to see if they learned how to fly, <laughs> there are videos you can see. <laughs> yes, ultimately that. Yeah, but that's what attracted the people. And this became a big thing in the organization, that will develop these mystic cities, because yogis can actually fly. Those who are highly advanced yogis, they can transfer themselves from one planet to another in the universe. But the cheap way of paying a million dollars ain't going to work. 
is not going to suddenly transform you into an accomplished yogi, that yogis do severe austerities for many, many lifetimes and they develop mystic power and so forth. No, it's not going to come cheap. But in Kali Yuga, there's a thing called cheaters and cheated. Yes. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur always said, the age, this age of Kali is the age of cheaters and cheated. Because there's unlimited numbers of persons who are ready to be cheated, and there's lots and lots of cheaters who are ready to cheat you and make lots of money off of you and get lots of sense gratification. They're bogus. So, I don't know how I got way around to this topic. It's all relevant. It all has a connection with Sri Guru Tattva. Okay. So, yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so you want to explain that? saying that also another final snare of maya is to think that I become guru. And I can shed some light on that because Srila Sridhar Maharaj actually told the words of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur that a Vaishnava, a Vaishnava must be, a guru must be a Vaishnava. So he says a Vaishnava never accepts any position. Because why? The Vaishnava only has one position, Nitya Krishna Das, I'm servant of Krishna. Whatever role he accepts, he never thinks, I have become this, I am a guru, I am a temple president, I am the king of a country. The Vaishnava never has this abhiman, he has only one, that I am a servant of Krishna. So, he says, that if a Vaishnava, if a person thinks that now I have become guru, even though he's taken the role of guru and many persons are calling him old guruji like this, but if he himself thinks that I have become guru, then Srila Bhakti Siddhanta starts with, he said, in Bengali language, the word guru, just a slight change of that word is guru. And guru means cow. So he's become cow. What, what does that mean? <laughs> Saeva Gokara. In the Srimad Bhagavatam it says uh, that persons who identify with the material body, Tridhatuke, uh, which is made of the three material elements, Kapa, Pitta, Vata, mucus, bile, and air. He thinks that the place where he's born is worshipful. He thinks that the reason for going to the holy places is to just take bath. Like so many different things in Srimad Bhagavatam telling like this. but at the end of that it says there that Janesu of the Yeshu Saeva Such persons who are in such ignorance, they're no better than a cow or an ass. Kara. Kara means donkey. So meaning that their mentality has not sufficiently properly developed yet to become uh, uh, aware of even the difference between their their self, their, their soul, and the material body. So if a person poses that I have now become very spiritually advanced, and now I'm going to take the position of guru, and now I will have so many others serving me, and I am guru, and I can give my remnants to others, and so forth, guru abhiman, this is called, then he actually enters into this category according to Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. Because it is ignorance. It is ignorance. It is not enlightenment. Enlightenment means I'm a tiny insignificant jiva. 
I'm wretched and I'm fallen. Who has declared this? The highest author of the highest book, Chaitanya Charitamrita, Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami. His self-conception in its ultimate depth, you know, and ultimate feelings within his heart, that I am lower than a worm in the stool. Can we conceive of that? That the highest guru is saying, I'm lower than a worm in the stool. And anyone becomes sinful if they associate with me. You see? This is real Vaishnavism. This is the real root of a guru. And guru also never thinks that my disciples belong to me. They belong to me. They're mine. Uh, mine, mine, I, me, mine. No. There's no conception like that in a pure Vaishnava. Everything is Krishna's. Everyone is Krishna's servant. I am only carrying out my duty that has been given to me by my guru to help the jivas. I'm only trying to carry out the order of Mahaprabhu, Nityananda Prabhu, to help every all jivas and help them come to the lotus feet of Krishna and Vaishnavas. That's all. And I have no personal qualification. Only I'm simply trying to carry out the instruction of my spiritual master. Srila Prabhupada, who accomplished the greatest feat that anybody has accomplished in this day of Brahma, uh, as far as spreading the mission of Lord Chaitanya throughout the world, uh, he did it. He's the one. He did it. Uh, and he's acknowledged as such, even by the greatest Vaishnavas, like Srila Bhakti Rakshak Sridharmaraj and so forth, empowered by Nityananda Prabhu. But what did he think of himself? He thought, I am not at all qualified. I have no special qualifications. But only one thing I can say is that I delivered, like a postman delivers a letter, I delivered the message of my spiritual master without tampering with it, without changing it. I delivered it as it is. If there is anything to my credit, that's all. But otherwise, I have no qualification. Srila Prabhupada also wrote in his preface to the Nectar of Devotion, his book uh, summarizing the great literature of Rupa Goswami Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. So Srila Prabhupada wrote in that book, he said, every preacher of the Krishna consciousness movement must never think that they have become a great preacher. Never they should think this. They should only think, I am nothing but an instrument. That's all. In the hands of the previous acharyas. That's all. Can a pen that is writing on the paper claim any independent power? Never. It's only being moved by the hand. So any creature in the movement of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu should never ever allow themselves to be disillusioned by the desire for name and fame and pratishta and all of this and think that now I have become very accomplished. I have become a master. I have become a guru. I am a very great preacher. No. Then you will fall down. You will fall down. You're already fallen, but many other stages of being fallen will follow. <laughs> you see, because this is not acceptable in the transcendental realm. It's, you can't get, you can't enter into the transcendental realm with the false ego. Huh? Is that possible? Not like the Christians who think I'm going to go there and and my wife and children and my dog and my cat and everyone's going to be there and I'm just going to be enjoying like anything. Yeah, God will be there somewhere also. No. Srila Sridhar Maharaj often used the term which is coined by Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur that you will have to die in order to live. Living means what? In your swaroop attaining your eternal spiritual form, your eternal spiritual service to the Supreme Lord, in His eternal Dham, with His eternal associates, and you can't go there, you can't even get a million miles from there, if you have any false ego at all. That I am great. Great? Lord Brahma, He is very great. Huh? 
Anybody in the universe and the highest demigods, they'll see he's quite great. But what does he think when he comes in front of Krishna? I'm a firefly. I'm a firefly in comparison with the sun. I'm nothing, nothing, nothing. So this is actual transcendental realization to realize my insignificance. I'm not significant. And he's all merciful, the Supreme Lord. Because he doesn't require, he's not forced by anything or anyone that he has to come down into this world, that he has to uh, rescue the conditioned souls. But he does because he is all love. He is made of love. He is made of ecstatic love. Rasa. What is the proof? That he comes. That he comes, yes. Right, that's what I'm saying. That he is not forced to come. He comes of his own accord. Because he has compassion and love and mercy for every tiny little jivatma, every jiva soul. Does he need another trillion jiva souls? Does he need that? Does he even need all of the Vaikuntha planets and the Loka Vrindavan and everything that exists? He doesn't need that. Why? Because guess what? He is Atmaram. Do you know what Atmaram means? Atmaram means that he is fully blissful and ecstatic and complete in his own self, his own Atma. And he also has another feature, Aptakam. Aptakam means that if any desire comes inside of him, he himself can fulfill that desire. Aptakam. Para? Para Yes. Means? He wants to experience happiness with others. Yes. And see, that's the next point that I'm making. You're always heading me off. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> so, now, he can fulfill all of his desires, he's optical. No one is required, but yet, there is something inside of him uh, called rasa. And he himself is the unlimited infinite. Try to understand the word infinite. We can't, because our brain is finite. But just try to understand, there is no limit at all in him. Nothing, 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 no limit. He can do anything. And himself, he is infinite. Ananta, Ananta. Without end, without end. Everything about him. So, because he's made of rasa, therefore his desire to taste rasa is also infinite. And therefore, with from inside of him comes his Shakti, which is not different than himself. And that Shakti potency uh, manifests to fulfill all of his infinite, infinite desires. And he himself is the abode and the ocean of unlimited spiritual qualities. 64 have been categorized, but there's actually an infinite number of qualities. It's 64. And amongst all of those qualities, he has one that <clears throat> that reigns supreme. What is that? Compassion. Mercy. Mercy. Odariyata. Complete mercy. Wants to give. He's not selfish. Although he's the supreme self, and he can be as selfish as he wants, but he's not. He wants to share. That's what uh, Rajanam Prabhu was saying, that he's parakam. He also wants to fulfill the desires of all others. And in fact, when his shakti manifests all of existence with all of his eternal associates and all the rasas and all the divine abodes and dhammas, <clears throat> he comes and enters into and performs his pastimes. Why? To fulfill their desires. Out of love. They desire to love and serve him. Therefore, he manifests so many different forms. 
and in fact all of his wait, and in fact all of his incarnations that appear within the material universes are for his devotees. Because he also loves to serve. Although he's the supreme served, but love means service. So his love to all jivas is also his service to all jivas, whether they're liberated souls or whether they're conditioned souls, Krishna loves all of them. And he serves all of them appropriately. And he tries to bring them to him so that they can eternally enjoy with him in the rasa dance. Yes, Srila Prabhupada said this, I was telling the other day. When I first met him, first time in 1971, and he was giving lecture and he was describing how the spiritual world, how everyone there wants to become more and more and more the servant, as opposed to the material world where everyone wants to become more and more and more the master, the master, the master. He said, but <clears throat> the spiritual world is completely the opposite. The more that you become the servant of the servant of the servant, actually your position becomes higher. It's a strange thing. The material world is the opposite. I, the more that I become the master of the master, I, my position becomes higher. But in the spiritual world, it's the actual truth. Because the material world is the perverted reflection of the spiritual world. And it's the opposite. So in the, material, in the spiritual world, the more that one becomes the servant, the higher the position becomes. And then Srila Prabhupada summarized in his lecture, he said the purpose of this Krishna consciousness movement is to bring all living entities uh, into the eternal rasa dance of Radha and Krishna. That blew my mind when I heard that after being a devotee for one year. That's where we're going. That's what we're in this movement for. Back to home, back to God. To go where? Into the eternal rasa dance of Radha and Krishna. To serve there. So, uh, yes. So anyway, uh, the transcendental topic. One more time. One more what? Point. Yes. is completely satisfied This is one side of the transcendental happiness that we shall experience. The other side of the spectrum is after time or part of the yeah. That he enjoys happiness with someone who is not belonging to him. That is arranged by the yes. Yeah. yeah, see, this will all branch out into many, many beautiful contemplations and different aspects of Rasa Tattva and all of that. And um, it's highly relishable. But if we begin to go in those directions, then we'll end up talking for one hour about what is Parakya Rasa and all of these topics. But yes, from the standpoint of analyzing his existence, it is true that that pleasure for him is the topmost. Why? Because there's an element there which could not really exist. <laughs> it couldn't exist. In his, in his, the reality of his own existence, because he's the, he's the master and he's the controller and he's anything he can fulfill his desires. <clears throat> but yet, Yoga Maya, for his relishing and tasting of rasa, she creates an existence where there's particular obstacles to his fulfilling his desires, and that enhances his desire to taste that rasa. Although really there is no possibility of any obstacle because he can accomplish all. But in that realm it's so inconceivable what Yoga Maya creates, so infinite varieties of his tasting rasa, and amongst those, the mood of parakya that he wants to enjoy with someone who apparently belongs to another. But he wants to steal away that person's heart and enjoy that person's love and affection, although it belongs, apparently, to another. But then we come to the topic of justice. Justice. In the material world, because it's the land of exploitation, yes, we're here. This is how Shiva Sridhar was always explained. 
Here we are in the land called the land of exploitation. Every living entity is trying to exploit the material nature and others in the environment. Everything is exploitation. So in the material world, they have to make laws to protect because everyone's trying to cheat another, everyone's trying to exploit another. So they have to make laws that if you get caught, that you exploited and cheated another, and you did a, a horrible act to somebody else, then, then you'll get captured and put into jail, and then you have to suffer and so forth. So this has to exist. <clears throat> and therefore, in the universe of the land of exploitation, there are systems of reward and punishment. Hmm? Because there are, the souls have deviated from the absolute will of the Supreme, and they want to become the Supreme, the Supreme Enjoyers, so they get entangled. But in the spiritual world, it is called the land of dedication. It is the opposite. Land of exploitation, land of dedication. Actually, it's, there's even another one. It's called the land of renunciation. Now, I'll explain that before I go to the, <coughs> to the dedication. Because in the material world, two things are always happening. The living entities are trying to enjoy, right? Bhog, Bhog means to enjoy. But they become frustrated with their attempt to enjoy. Inevitably, it will always happen. There is no possibility of it not happening, no matter how much you uh, fantasize that there can be a situation where it's not going to happen, uh, that you're going to suffer after you try to enjoy, but you will find out eventually. So then some persons, they start thinking, oh, uh, I know how I, can, I, how I can become happy. I'll renounce everything. All the things of this material world that are causing so much stress and strife and trouble, and, you know, I've been trying to exploit everything, so I'm going to take the opposite position, and I'm going to come, become neutral. Neutral. Now, I'm going to renounce. Renounce. Uh, and I'm going to examine that everything here is false. Neti, neti. That means not this, not this. Not, this is not the truth. This is not the truth. It's all false. It's all deception. It's all lying. It's all blah, blah, blah. So they think like this. <clears throat> and then they think that I will end this existence of exploitation by renunciation and I'll attain bhukti. But actually, the Srimad Bhagavatam tells that those persons who think that they've attained this impersonal liberation, they're actually only imagining this. Uh, they have avishuddha buddhayo. That means that their, their uh, intelligence is actually avishuddha. It's impure. Why is it impure? Because it's still grasped by illusion that I am the Supreme. Is still the illusion and the last snare of Maya. So what happens to those? <coughs> How does it first begin? I know. Arushya Krishna Param Padam Tatam Patantiya Ho Anadrita Yushpat Andraya. But the first part I forgot. Oh yeah, yeah. Yenye Arvindaksha Vimukta Mani Nas. Twayasta Bhava Avishuddha Buddhayo. O oh, my dear lotus eyed Lord, yen ye aravindaksha means lotus eyes. Vimukta maninas, those who believe vimukta, that they become liberated, maninas, uh, actually, yes, what is it? Vimukta maninas, twayasta bhava avishuddha buddhayo, actually, they're still in impure consciousness. They have not become liberated. Avishuddha buddhayo. And then what happens? Avruhya krichena param padam tata. They think that they have become liberated and they have attained this highest param pada. But what actually happens to them? Patamti adha. They again have to go back down. Because patamti adho anadrita yushmad angraya. Because they have not taken shelter and they have not developed the mood of worship and adoration and service to your divine lotus feet. Therefore, they have to again fall down into the material world. Their position is not fixed. So that is called 
ex uh, renunciation. So in the material world, this is just going on. Bo, enjoyment, tia, renunciation. And back and forth, like a pendulum swings, back and forth, back and forth. The living entities, lifetime after lifetime, are doing this. Sometimes they're trying to enjoy bog, then sometimes they're trying to renounce. Srila Prabhupada gives a nice example. Like in the material world, a person who's a successful businessman, he's making lots of money, right? And he goes into the city and he works very hard. And it's very stressful, and he sometimes goes without eating and sleeping, and he works very hard, and uh, he makes a lot of money. But then he's always complete. He's all in anxiety because he's just been trying to get material enjoyment and material exploitation and everything. So his heart is not peaceful and satisfied. So what does he do? He goes uh, because they usually they try to keep a nice little cottage, a getaway place in a kind of foresty surrounding in the mode of goodness, right? So that they can escape from the mode of passion and come to the mode of goodness. And in the city, then they'll, I mean, in the countryside, then they'll calm down. They'll exhale. So this is their tiag. This is their renunciation. See? They're very driven to enjoy, and then, now they gotta get relief from that effort. So now, tiag. They don't really renounce, but it's like temporary. So they go back and forth, back and forth. So even to the highest position, those who are not taking shelter of the Supreme Absolute Truth, Personality of Godhead, who has divine lotus feet, who all the planets and all the sages and all the demigods are taking shelter there, if some impure jiva doesn't take shelter there, then what happens to him? He has to again come down and go through the same thing again, lifetime after lifetime. So what is the alternative? Luckily, there is an alternative. It's called the land of dedication. Where the Supreme Absolute Truth exists with all his divine paraphernalia. And he is enjoying. And he is the Supreme Enjoyer. And everyone there is serving him for his enjoyment. Nobody has even the slightest tinge of selfish interest separate from his enjoyment. That's why they can go there. Yes. It's simple. It's simple. But still some people think, no, I'm going to go there. I'm going to get liberated. I'm going to go to Vaikuntha. I'm even going to go to Goloka because I chanted my 16 rounds and followed the four regulated principles. And now when I die, I'm going there. Because Prabhupada said. But what did Rupa Goswami say? Prabhupada's following Rupa Goswami. Prabhupada also didn't say that if this is all that you do, you'll go there. But now they've come to that understanding that if I just do that, I'm going back to God because I have the card. I have the institutional card. I was part of this institution with these letters, I, S, K, etc., etc. I'm part of this institution, so I paid my dues, and I lived as at least some kind of devotee. I mean, I wasn't a very good devotee, but I mean, in the early days, I really surrendered a lot when I was a new brahmacharya, brahmacharini, and I haven't really done much of anything the last, so occasionally I'll chant 16 rounds or this or that, and but, you know, I play tennis, and I, you know, I, I do everything that's not devotional, but still, I, I'm a devotee, I'm a devotee, and I believe, I believe that I'm going there because, you know, I did it in this life. I've already paid my dues and I'm going there. So this is like born-again Christianity, isn't it? It's just like that. Born-again Christianity. I believe that Jesus died for me to save me from my sins. So it's a good deal because I can go on sinning. But in the meantime, he's my Lord and Master, and I'm I'm going to heaven because he saved me. So this is the same exact, practically identical mentality. I've been saved. I believe I'm going there. But guess what? You're going to have to pay a price to go there. It's called pure bhakti. Because you can't go there unless you have pure bhakti. But yet they have an explanation of how it's possible. 
They have an explanation of how it's possible. Even though you're not pure, you're very far from being pure. But guess what? At the time of death, uh, suddenly Prabhupada's going to come, or Krishna's going to, or Lord Chaitanya, and he'll just immediately eradicate everything and, and suddenly give you pray, and then you can go there. Make up the difference. Make up the difference. They came to Guru and the religion of this talk, and they asked this question. Prabhupada said, yeah. If we chant 16 rounds before we fall into the <coughs> then we will go back home, back to Baba. So Guru Dev started laughing. Yes. And he said, Your Prabhupada is very clever. <laughs> <laughs> he tricked all of you so that you start to chant. Yes. But after 16 rounds, if you develop no place for chanting more, then what is the use of chanting? He wants you to chant the Kirtanya. Yes. And to, and to do that, to do Kirtaniya Sadahari, what do you have to first do? Mahaprabhu told four things. Trinada Pisa Nijena. You have to realize, I'm nothing, I'm insignificant. I'm, I'm going to call on you in a second. No, I want to. <laughs> I just keep getting carried away. Trinada Pisa Nijena. It's an important shloka. Guess what? If you don't know this shloka and you don't follow it, you're never even become, be going to become a Madhya Madhikari, okay? Once you speak of Uttam and developing Krishna praying, you're not even going to enter into Madhya unless you have followed this shloka, heart and soul, and you've realized, I'm nothing. Chanada Pisanish. And Chanada Pisanishnana, guess what? Whatever difficulties are coming to me, this one devotee, he's treating me so bad, and this person doesn't recognize who I am, and this person, and you know, it's called tolerant as a tree. Tree never complains. Tree doesn't even think about it. What to think of complaining about it? It's just because I'm at fault. Not that other person. Not this person. Nobody. Nobody's my enemy. Nobody's victimizing me. But those who don't have this consciousness, they immediately have to retaliate. You know, and you're always upsetting me. And you're always. This is the problem with neophyte devotees all the time. Because they're not doing bhajan. Because they're not realizing the actual process. So therefore they always find fault with the others without finding fault with them or their own self. But a madhyam begins with finding fault with myself. I'm not qualified. I actually have so many faults. I'm the lowest of the low. Huh? Uh, <coughs> is that song? Uh, Amar Jivan. Just read that song by Bhakti Vinod Tagore. My life. My, what is my life? My life is that I'm always sinful. My life is that when other people become happy, I become sad to see them become happy. And when other people become sad, I become happy to see them sad. Like this. He's illustrating. What is my real condition? So, without this verse, without becoming tolerant as a tree, genuinely, understanding deeply within your heart, I have no good qualifications. And it's really my fault. Uh, because Atma, Kriptam, I did it to myself. In previous lives, I must have mistreated someone so badly, and now Krishna's giving me a token punishment for that, and now I'm, I'm suffering. But instead, no, you're causing me suffering. I don't like you. I'm not going to talk to you anymore, blah, blah, blah. This is a neophyte. Very neophyte. So then the third thing. Oh, guess what? Now you have to give honor and respect to every jiva. That's a tough one. Even the person that is offending me. Huh? You have to honor and respect every jiva in any species of life. Never causing harm, never causing pain to them, never putting them in anxiety, always dealing very gently with every jiva. That's called huh? mana dena, giving respect. And the other one, fourth one, amanina not desiring any kind of respect for myself. Ah, uh, mani na. I don't require because I'm no one, I'm nothing. Why should I be honored? And if somebody comes to honor me, I only understand this is only my Guru Maharaj. He's creating this situation so that I can do some service to his lotus feet. That's all. But never ever desiring any respect for oneself. Unless someone can do this, they can't even enter into Madhyam. So, as Rajanath Prabhu said, uh, Prabhupada, he was, he was encouraging everyone. 
to chant the holy names of Krishna 16 rounds, follow four regular principles, purify yourself. Because if you do that, and you avoid offenses, <clears throat> then gradually your heart's going to become purified, and gradually one day you will come to the level where you can attain Nishta. And this mood will develop within your heart. Uh, genuine mood of Nishta means these Trinadapis of me. So I want to call the Tridani Maharaj, he had some uh, very keen. small point, they are going back to the Yes. Sometime. Yes. That's why. Right. If you call the chariot of Lord Jagannath, yeah. it said yeah. all your difficulties and etc. Yeah. And I realized one time I called it, the difficulties didn't go away. So it's like the time frame. That's right. Or actually, you know. That yes. Time. Yeah. You know. So it's like there's a criterion when the, when when it is told in a simple way to new devotees just chant 16 rounds and follow the four regular principles and also try to preach Prabhupada always encourages his disciples to try to preach and and then you'll go back to Godhead for sure but he would not tell that you know in this very life absolutely for sure if you only do this you'll go back to Godhead there was a hidden message like Gurudev laughed and he said oh he was very tricky because he knew that this is the way to engage them in the beginning stages, to make them enthusiastic, to encourage them. <coughs> so, therefore he said, just do this and you'll get this result. But he also knew that the books that he's giving are telling that there's a lot more that you have to do. Well, to speak of Chaitanya Charitamrita, when I met, when I read that, in the early period after it just came out, before I had Sadhu Sangha with Sri Sridhar Maharaj, Sri Gurudev, I was, uh, I started to think, wow, whoa, how am I going to get there from where I am now? I mean, I'm not thinking of uh, my eternal service to Radha and Krishna and the eternal Dham. I, I'm certainly not thinking uh, of serving the lotus feet of Srimati Radhika, of becoming a gopi, or any of this. I'm just thinking that I'll chant Hare Krishna, I'll go back to God, and uh, then I'll become whatever. I'll become a coward boy, or I'll become a, you know, even a blade of grass, I'll become a Viva Loka Vrindavan. It wasn't clear, you know? My brother is complaining that not only about trying to understand his things, yes. just simply work hard your whole life. But yes. <laughs> because Prabhupada said a very nice little one-liner, Work now and oh, you all know that quote, huh? Work now and samadhi later. That's for the neophyte devotees to understand that don't try to endeavor to do this deep, intensive, internal, you know, near Jan Bhajan, all in a secluded place. Even Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati wrote an entire song about what kind of Vaishnava are you, my wicked mind. You always want to be in a secluded place, but actually you really want Pratishta, you want all this. There's a whole song that he wrote, very, very long. Yeah, I'm, I'm winding it right now. You see, so that, that desire is so subtle. And the neophyte devotees, they, they're infested with anartas. So if they try to do that in the neophyte condition, what will happen? Prabhupada said, you'll simply sleep and think of sex life. That's your level of adhikara. You'll sleep and think of sex life. You may be chanting, 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 but that's what's going to happen to you because impurities are there. So therefore, work now. Now. Not later. Now. You're young. You have a physical body, very strong. To Guru Seva. Go and preach. Exhaust yourself till you can't even walk at the end of the day. 